Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni mui wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show, and please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app. On Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods, Podcast Attic, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Gregory G. Allen. He is here to celebrate the Monsters of Marymount Mansion. Before we invite Greg into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Since the Baby Came, a sibling's learning to love story told in 16 poems. Written by Kathleen Long Bostrom. This charming, playful story in verse introduces children to This charming, playful story in verse walks kids through all the twists and turns of welcoming a new baby into the family. Mama is having a baby. Everything's starting to change. God, can you tell me what happened? Life is becoming so strange. Since the Baby Came offers a unique take on a timeless topic. The heartfelt and humorous drama unfolds completely in verse, addressing the full range of emotions a young child experiences when a new baby joins a family. From surprise and confusion to feelings of neglect and jealousy to wholehearted tenderness and affection, this book also introduces young children to the playfulness and fun of various forms of poetry. You're going to love it. And you're going to want it in your family library. It's Since the Baby Came, a sibling's learning to love story by Kathleen Long Bostrom. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by the books by Yobi Q. Yobi Q is absolutely one of my favorite guests here on the podcast. Through her visits to the podcast, I've learned that Yobi began her career as a preschool teacher while she was in college. As an educator, she taught kids and their families to embrace love and diverse cultures. Since leaving the classroom, she's dedicated herself to writing kids' books featuring Asian characters and Asian cultures, helping kids like her wonderful daughter feel seen, heard, and represented. You're going to love the books by Yobi Pew. Books like I Am an Amazing Asian Girl, I Am a Bold Asian Boy, and of course, her debut children's book, our Lunar New Year, celebrating Lunar New Year in Asian communities. Yobi's even created her own board game called Guess the Asian Food. And recently, Yobi debuted her beautiful new podcast. It's called Rise and Shine with Yobi Q. We're, we're so proud of everything that Yobi is doing, and we want you to check out her website. It is buyyobiq.com. That's B Y. Y O B E Q I U dot com by Yobi Q to discover all of Yobi's wonderfulness. And before Greg comes into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Monsterious. Book number one in the series is Escape from Grimstone Manor, written by Matt McMahon. Monsterious is a spooky middle grade series featuring monsters and mysteries. It is ideal for fans of Goosebumps, Stranger Things, and Five Nights at Freddy's. There's so many reasons you're going to love Monsterious. Here's just a few. They're short. They're great for both reluctant and avid readers. Uh, they can be read in any order. Each book is a standalone adventure with a unique cast of diverse characters. They're targeted for kids ages 8 to 12, but everybody loves Monsterious because they are fast-paced, spooky thrillers with lots of action, humor, and art. And here's something I especially love. Every chapter ends with a cliffhanger. 
I, I mean, kids and adults, you can't help but want to keep reading Monsterious. Book number one is Escape from Grimstone Manor. The series is written by Matt McMahon. You're going to love it. Escape from Grimstone Manor, book number one in the Monsterious series. Join us right now from the great state of New Jersey. Our guest is here today to celebrate his fantastic chapter book. It's called The Monsters of Marymount Mansion. Please welcome to the show, Gregory G. Allen. Hey, Gregory, how are you? I am great. Thank you so much for having me. And you know what? Now that I'm on your show, you can call me Greg. You've got the Gregory G. Allen out of the way. I'm Greg. <laughs> Greg, thanks so much for being on the show. You you seem so nice. You don't seem like a monster at all. Well, you know what? Maybe maybe we all have a little bit of monster. And, and, and that's what I'm using <laughs> is that um, there's a diversity among humans. There's a diversity among monsters. So that's that's part of what the story's about. I never thought about monster diversity. I, how, how terrible I've been in my thinking <laughs> towards that. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the about the book. Sure. So um, this book first came to me a long time ago. I'm a man of a certain age, but back when I was in high school, I wrote three musicals that were all produced by a local children's theater company. And the very first show I ever wrote was called Dracula Bites at Dusk. And it was about Dracula and monsters and, and all of these creatures of Halloween that had to stay in this basement of this house. Um I don't have the script. I couldn't find anything. But the story kept coming back in my head all these years later. I remember asking mom, I'm like, do we have anything with this? So I tried to go by memory. And I, I, I would think, let me just zero in on the monster. And it's this little monster, Toby, who lives with his family in the basement of, of the Marymount Mansion. Celeste Marymount runs the mansion kind of like a bed and breakfast. And she has these monsters downstairs for decades that she's just taken care of. And she lets them come up on Halloween because they can mingle with the guests and look like they're in a Halloween costume. Oh. So they can fit in at that time. And little Toby decides, well, wait a minute. Why can I only go out one time of year? Maybe I should be venturing out and going out at other times of the year. So he makes this decision. He's like, well, there's other holidays. I can put on another costume and go out. And it's. Really, the book is about self-acceptance. It's about um, inclusion, diversity, all these things that I think young kids should be should be learning about, but told through the eyes of a monster. How neat and uh, how ingenious to you know talk about this idea of diversity and accepting others who are different by talking about monsters. You know, I've been I've been telling this story I think for so many years. Um, about 11 years ago, my first children's book came out, which was called Chicken Boy, The Amazing Adventures of a Superhero with Autism. It was based on my godson. He was in the third grade at the time. I did not think I was going to write children's books. I write adult novels. I write these other things. And this book just came out of me from one night from being with him and his family. I would go out every week with them for dinner. And I started writing about the superhero with autism. Well, the book was chosen to win with the Me Genius Author Challenge. They published the book. They made a big deal about it. I started traveling to schools. And part of what I talk about when I go to schools is don't be afraid of someone because they're different. Just because somebody with autism might flap their wings, they, they you know, they, they flap. And so they make noises. That doesn't mean you have to fear them. So I've been telling this story about it's okay to be different. I wrote a sequel to that book. Then I wrote a, another picture book about a squirrel who doesn't want to gather nuts. He wants to be inside a theater performing as he watches kids rehearsing for a play. And so I kept writing about this, these diverse ways to tell a story about, hey, if you're a child that feels different, it's absolutely okay. We're all different. Some of us wear glasses. Some have blonde hair. Some have dark hair. Some have no hair. We, we, we are in a world that's all about being different. So... It just hit me last year, and I thought, I've got to tell this story. I've got to go back to that first story that I ever told as a teenager and tell that as a children's book. Now, I thought it would be another picture book, and I wrote it first as a picture book, and it, it was just – it there was too much story there for a picture book. So that's why it became a chapter book. Wow. What a, uh, what a great journey that story has taken. It really has. I mean, when you when I look back and I go – it's almost 40 years old. I mean, I'm in my 50s, so this is an old story that, I, that I'm bringing back out. 
But I got to tell you, there's there's this excitement I have about this book coming out. You're an author, you know, our books are our children. They are our babies that we can't wait to put out there into the world. And I'm really, really excited because this one, there's something different about it. And maybe because I went back to my own youth um, with the story that I just, I kind of can't wait to get it out there for people to be reading it. Yeah. Well, that is neat. And I certainly remember some of, of the things that I created back in middle school and high school. And, and in fact, in middle school, we, me and a couple of friends of mine, we used to create these things. We called it tape radio because well, we we could create our show on little cassette tapes and share them with oh, yeah. friends. By the time the fifth generation came up, we could barely hear anything except the hiss. But none of those exist anymore. But I remember doing it and working, how much fun it was, how neat it was that you're able to take this story that had a life when you were in high school and then update it and bring it out to a new audience and uh, and, and help them learn this great lesson. Well, I think it's about the lesson. And I also, when I when I speak to, to children in schools, you know, I always say, who here loves to write? Who here loves to read? Who who likes to play sports? Who like? And I, I go through all the different things they like to do. And I want to encourage them at that age, start writing. You like to write, keep writing. And it doesn't mean just always write what the what your teacher's telling you. Here's your writing assignment this week. My mom would, would keep the spiral notebooks from when I was a kid, tons of stories. I would write plays. I would direct the neighborhood kids in a play in the backyard and then, you know, have the adults come and watch us perform them. I was always a storyteller. And and I moved to New York. I grew up in Texas and I moved to New York to be an actor. But the woman who ran the children's theater company in in Texas said, Greg thinks he's going to be an actor, but he's going to be a writer. And she said that in in a newspaper article that was written about me as I was heading off to New York. And I thought, well, what, what is she talking about? Well, she was right. Like, I, I'm a storyteller. I can't help but tell stories. Yeah. Well, that's I, – I, I imagine that must have been kind of, 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 you know, like, wow, it's a compliment, but I want to be an actor. You know, when you read that, it's like, what you? you know, like kind of one of those backhanded compliments you used to get. Oh, absolutely. And at 18, I, you know, I'm sure I was kind of like, well, who does she think she yeah, is telling me I'm not going to be her. And, and I, I, look, I went to New York. I was a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. I toured the country wearing that costume. I did Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. I, I got to do some acting things, which was great. But um, I just, I think when I wrote the children's book 11 years ago, I had no idea it was going to change the trajectory of my, of what I do creatively. And I love traveling to schools and talking to students. I love it. And and I've talked to thousands and thousands throughout the past decade. And there's just, it brings me such joy to see how they relate to the stories that I'm telling them and to hear back from them about what it is that they're working on. I, I really, really love that. Yeah. Being somebody that's been doing school shows for over 30 years, I certainly relate to how one really is wonderful. And it's... Um, uh, it's magical since I'm doing it. But, you know, it's not just I'm doing magic shows, but that interaction with kids really is magical because you never know, especially when you're inviting kids to participate through their questions or helping you out on stage, you have no idea where it's going. And, you know, there have been times when kids have asked questions that, that have sent teachers running into the hallways because they're from the I think you couldn't have asked that, but um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, what's been the interaction that stood out most for you of all the different schools and interactions you've had with kids? What's the, you know, maybe one or two things that, that happened with those audiences that really kind of stand out for you for, for whatever reason? Sure. Well, I would say one of them is when I would talk about my godson, I would say he would make this noise and he would go, Baka! for no reason. And the audience would laugh when I would do it. And I said, I know, it's funny, right? And then I would turn that around to, but he couldn't help but make that noise. And so I took that noise and I made it his battle cry as the superhero. And his battle cry was, Baka! And those kids that snicker and laugh at the start of the session are all screaming, Baka! by the end, owning the word in a powerful way. And it puts the biggest smile on my face because 
they're doing exactly what I hope to do by writing that book was, you know, it's you can make fun of someone and you can tease them. And I talk about bullying and how pe- kids with special needs are, are often bullied and they can't go to a teacher and an adult and say they're being bullied because mm-hmm. many of them are nonverbal. So we talk about bullying, but I love how I could steer that by the end And they're all like, no, I'm going to say that silly word and I'm going to stand here. And they're leaving the auditorium saying, "Baka." So I I love moments like that. I I look forward to going to schools to talk about uh, Toby and and the monsters because, again, it is someone who feels so isolated. He feels alone. But I think representation matters. Like for all these years, I've been talking about special needs. But representation matters for all these kids. And it was very – Last year, before we ended the school year, I was able to have some students read this book, be my beta testers. And I had one teacher, a first grade teacher, read it to her entire class. And then she had me come in and I and I spoke to them and they gave the most amazing feedback, sometimes picking up on parts of the story that I I did not even zero in in when I was writing it. And I'll be honest as an author and say, listen, sometimes we're writing and we don't know every single message that we're giving It is a joy. It is an honor. It is humbling when a student turns around and tells you something they picked up from your story and you go, wow, I didn't realize that message was there. As simple as, oh, I was sad when Toby went outside because his parents told him not to leave the basement, but that he owned up and he confessed to it. I'm like, oh, there are all these other stories that they're seeing. And when I worked with my illustrator, um, Shelby Goodwin, who is amazing, I said, my biggest thing is I want to make sure we have diversity in the full illust- in, in the illustrations throughout the book. You know, chapter books, you maybe have 30 illustrations versus a picture book on every page. But we made sure the humans, the monsters are all very diverse in this book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're talking about kids feeling alone and isolated and i i think that when we first hear that where it's like oh yeah well if there's a kid who speaks french in in a group of english kids or a kid uh diff- different ethnicity or different race but i think one of the things that we've come to realize here on the podcast is that lots of kids feel isolated they feel different they might be the only they they, you know there there is some issues at home um and they might feel they're the only ones whose families are dealing with this issue or that issue and so i think that you know kids can relate to that idea of feeling alone and feeling left out and how important it is for us to reach out to everyone and help them feel welcome I, I completely agree with you on that because it doesn't have to be what we would say is something major to make you feel like you're different, that, oh, I must fall in this class of child to to have that. You're right. I, I think at some point in their life, most kids go through that feeling of, well, I must be the only one feeling this way. And so I I think I wanted to to convey in this book that, you know what, this monster's feeling this way. But maybe you're relating um, to this monster. I got a lot of comments that these kids were really empathizing with the monster. And not one kid went, well, I was scared because he was a monster. Not a single student said that. And these were first graders. They were totally empathizing with what he was going through, with his feeling of the isolation as he's looking out the window into the real world, wanting to be out. And who doesn't sometimes feel, I just want to get out of here? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I thought in... We layer as we write as an author, and those layers are not always obvious to the reader, and that's completely fine. But, I mean, I even thought of, like, the Diary of Anne Frank when I was writing this book. Things such as that, that nobody will ever know except me, that that's what was in my head. But thinking of those feelings of isolation, of having to hide, of how how can I get out of this moment and um, and venture out into the world – Or as kids go from one grade to the next, they have all those fears and anxieties of just moving up a grade. And so it's, it's that, how do I, how do I slowly move out into this part of the world? Kindergarten to first grade, that's huge. I remember thinking in first grade, my sister was three, I was three years older than me. How am I ever going to read those books that she's read? Like things of that nature. 
And then you go, oh, yeah, every year I'm going to learn and it's going to get me there. So um, I, I do think that a lot of kids can have those feelings. Um, I think it's just a universal feeling for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And and such a great conversation that we can have with our kids. Uh, you know, talking talking about Toby, talking about the monsters of Marymount Mansion and helping our kids understand, that, hey, you have the power to reach out and help those kids who are feeling left out come in. And then maybe, hopefully, while we're having those conversations, it might make our kids feel comfortable enough to let us know when they're feeling left out. You're absolutely right. And that, you know, one of the exciting things about writing, going from picture book to an early reader chapter book, is I know it's to be used as kids are starting to learn to read. That means families coming together, reading it together. Not that they weren't reading the picture books together because the kids are looking at the pictures and the, the parents or, or, or the teachers or an adult is reading the text. But now they can turn around and as they're learning, they can read it to the adult. So they're still together so they can still discuss the themes of it. One of the, one of the themes of this book, and, and it's just slightly in there, it's about chosen family. Because Celeste, the, the woman that runs the mansion, talks about her family not coming to visit her. They're not coming for the holidays this year. They've given up on this house. I'm the only one thinking about it. And she has this couple that works with her. And the woman says, well, we're like your chosen family. And then the monsters feel that way because Celeste also feels very isolated and alone. And she's taking care of these monsters. So that concept of chosen family because not, as you mentioned before, sometimes there's something happening in your own family. Maybe your family is broken. Maybe you're, you're from a divorced um, family and you think it's just you. So that concept of chosen family of the people that we get to have in our lives that's closest to us. When I moved from Texas, 3000 miles away to New York, I had to create a chosen family up here to find because I was only seeing my family once a year. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I said, it's a small part of the book, but it's definitely in there. And I think it's an important part of the book because there are so many kids. Be, you know, you're mentioning, you know, you're of a certain age. I am of a certain age, a little bit older, and life is different. You know, I grew up in a neighborhood. It was a real pain in the neck. It seemed like everybody was related to me. At least everybody who caught me doing something wrong was an aunt or an uncle. would <laughs> bat me, and, you know, they thought they was fine. They could hit me, hit me in the head. Um, but we don't live like that anymore. It's much more common for a family um, that they're 20 miles away from their closest relative or 3,000 miles away from their closest relative. And it's important to have people in our lives, people we can depend on, people we can love. And oftentimes now more than ever, it's that chosen family. It, and, and, you know, you're talking about the difference when we grew up versus now. It's so wild when I will talk to my nieces or nephews, and I even have a great nephew, and it's through FaceTime. They are so used to FaceTime. I live in a box to them. My, my two, well, it'll be three soon. So the, the, the three-year-old knows that, you know, Greg is that guy in the box. And I have um, a niece that just started third grade. So last year, um, my mother read this book to her as I was working on it. And every time she'd go visit my mom, she'd say, hey, can we hear more from the monster book? She sat down and she drew me a picture of what she thought Toby and, and his little sister Michaela and they looked like before there were any illustrations. And that meant so much to me because it's all about their imagination. That first grade class all drew pictures. When I went in, they gave me pictures. So that was a very I, – I actually have some of them up on my website so that people can see well before an illustration was ever drawn, these kids were using their imagination. Um, and so that is one thing that is still the same as when we were younger. But so many things have definitely changed through through the decades of how kids uh, are growing up today. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know, Greg, one of the things I want to talk to you about is it sounds from our conversations and our communication via email beforehand that you have a very dynamic school presentation. I haven't seen it, but I just know from our conversations, it's like you are going in that you're putting on a show, even if it's you're reading from your book and taking questions. That is much more dynamic than 
what a lot of authors think of is like, yeah, I'm just going to go and read my book and then sit back and see what happens. Um, we have a lot of authors who listen to the show and um, – what advice can you give them as they're thinking about this to help them get out of their mind and help them understand, no, you got to go in there and do a little bit more than sit in a rocking chair and read your book if you want to keep their attention because these guys, guys are growing up on, you know, Sesame Street that everything's flashing. It changes every 10 seconds. Yeah. You know, how do we how do we create that dynamic uh, school presentation that's really going to be meaningful for kids? You know, it's, I was just discussing this because I said – I can do my first two books in my sleep, meaning I've been doing it for so long. I can go in. I'm not reading. I have them memorized. And I said, it's going to be so different now with monsters because the questions will be different. Things will be different. Um, for me, it is all about grabbing their attention, knowing when I need to change the subject. I hold off the fact that I toured as a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. I keep that later in the story. So when I see if I start to lose them, that comes out and I see them perk up. They're like, what? He was a Ninja Turtle. You get to know right away who the um, <laughs> who the kid is in the class that usually thinks who he is. And he's going to raise his hand and he's going to make some funny comment back. Um, right away. I make sure they know, oh, no, I can give it back to you. You're going to be funny. I'm going to be funny back to you. Not trying to attack a child by any mm -hmm. means, mm -hmm. but I will definitely say – I will definitely show I, – I know that might work for you usually, but I'm going to turn it around in a funny way, and we're going to have a good time here. Um, because there's always one. There's always that one. And the funniest thing was one time it happened, and the kid came up to me afterwards and was like then like, I have a question for you. And I'm like – of course you do, because you saw we had a connection. You thought you had to come to this school assembly, and it, you were too cool to be here. And then he ended up really liking the assembly. Um, the Q&As can be difficult. I'm not going to lie. Kids will say anything. I tend to prefer to run around the auditorium. I don't like to stand on a stage. I will even go into some of them, and I'll tell the principal, I'm going to be right down here in front of them on the ground. And he's like, perfect, because if I'm way far away up on a stage, it's too far. I need to be able to run up and down the aisles, point to kids, get the question, and move on. Um, and like you said, teachers will come up and be like, how did, how were you answering that? I'm like, sometimes it's just off the top of my head, because they will get into specifics about autism, and I will say, I'm not a doctor. Mm -hmm. I'm not a teacher. I'm a go I'm a godfather who loves his godson with autism. And now actually my niece was also diagnosed with autism. I'm just this man that, that loves these children. And so I'm here to share this story with you. But I will answer, of course, as much as I can, because through 10 years I've, I have learned a lot. Mm -hmm. But if there's something I don't know, I will turn to the special needs teacher in the room and ask them if they will answer that question instead. So it's really about just being quick on your feet. Um, <laughs> mentally and physically, because quick on my feet, running around those rooms, it's it's great exercise. <laughs> it is, and it also um, it it really sets you apart because it gives gives kids something to look at. You know, I, I, anybody, I, if you've seen Eddie Murphy or Chris Rock or Richard Pryor on stage doing their stand up, they pace across mm -hmm. the stage. And, you know, that is something, if I'm on, on stage in the theater, that's what I'm doing <laughs> back and forth or I'm in the audience. And um, it, 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 it does. It gives, it gives kids something to look at. Um, it, it keeps them on their toes, adds a little bit of, of uh, lots of energy to the show, a little bit of excitement. And, uh, yeah, these are great things. Um, I, I think a podium speech can really bore a child too much. So if I walk in and I see a podium, I'm like, Oh no, I can't see. <laughs> and I do have an acting background, so I do want to engage and be active and and you know a little bit more animated than hi uh, Bueller Bueller. You know, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Hey, I'm curious. Um, you mentioned how much you love your godson, and that Chicken Man was based on your godson. Is he aware that he was the inspiration for that book? And if so, what does he feel? How does he feel? So it's so now he is 21 years old. So um, I'm watching him uh, navigate adulthood in such a different way. But when the book came out, 
he did not understand he which came first, the chicken or the egg. Mm-hmm. He didn't know which came first. So we would see him reading the book, and he would make a noise, and he would go, hey, look, I'm chicken boy, because he was <laughs> reading it from the book. So I found that so fascinating that he, he didn't get the concept that, no, this is based on you. But the the first time um, when the book came out, they um, the, the publisher – did like a party at his school. So they gave them all of these, these books in the library. We, I went there, I did an assembly and he was there. And in between the two assemblies where they were letting students go, he got up on the stage at the mic and he started reading the book. And I never heard him do that. I grabbed my camera so fast as he sat there reading through the book. And I was just, I was amazed. He, it's not that he's, he's verbal. He's not nonverbal, but you have to pull it out of him. You have to ask, questions that are more than just yes, no, to get answers from him. Um, So it was pretty special to me when I sat there and saw him reading the book. But he never quite got, even now, that he was the actual inspiration. That's cool. Cool. What a great story. Hey, Greg, where can we go to find out more about the monsters of Marymount Mansion and more about you? You can go to gregsimagination.com. G-R-E-G-S, imagination.com, and you can find all four of my my books there. During the pandemic, we took my book, Irving the Theater Nut, and we turned it into a short film. So I manage a theater in Westchester County, New York. Like everyone else, we were closed during the pandemic, trying to find something to do. We socially distanced with some kids and turned it into a short film using children playing the squirrels and whatnot, it was so much fun, and so I have that posted up there on the on the website as well. Awesome. We'll have to check that out. We've had a great time speaking to the author of The Monsters of Marymount Mansion, a great chapter book from our guest, Gregory G. Allen. Hey, Greg, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We have two great guests. William Stevenson will be here to celebrate his Ricky's Dream Trip series. And Laura Leone will be here to celebrate Adventures with Zane. That's the next episode of the podcast. Hey, let's give a big thank you to the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, let's start by thanking our guest, Gregory G. Allen. Please be sure to check out Greg's The Monsters of Marymount Mansion. Also want to thank our sponsors, The Books by Yobi Q. One of my favorites is Our Lunar New Year. You can find out all about the books by Yobi Q by visiting her website, buyyobiq.com. Also want to thank Since the Baby Came, a beautiful story in verse written by Kathleen Long Bostrom. And of course, we want to thank Matt McMahon, the author of Monsterious Book Number One, Escape from Brimstone Manor. My team, they are awesome and they deserve a big thank you. Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Soji Franklin, and O'Leary. My beautiful wife, she is amazing and she deserves such a big thank you for everything she does for me. And of course, you, you are part of our beautiful Reading with Your Kids family. You deserve a huge thank you, not only for joining us, for, for, but for making the world a better place. And believe it or not, you do that every time you read with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.